Good afternoon and welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. John, welcome. Yeah, please uh, take a seat. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. One of our panelists, Eamon Ryan, has to leave at 3 o'clock. So we're going to get going uh, right away. Uh, welcome and good afternoon. I'm David Hochschild uh, with the California Energy Commission. And can we uh, close the doors in the back, please? Thank you. Uh, and very happy to be uh, here with these distinguished panelists today, whose uh, resumes and bios are so long, I think I could take the whole panel discussion just reading them, but I'll just briefly uh, summarize. Um, we have to my right Dr. Yufu Cheng, who is the China Country Director for R20, uh, Regions of Climate Action chaired by Governor Art Arnold Schwarzenegger, been working around the world with uh, federal and subnational governments on uh, clean energy and climate policy. To his right, is Jim Wonderman, who is president and CEO of the Bay Area Council, leading uh, public policy and advocacy uh, work uh, in the business community to promote uh, climate-friendly policy and based in San Francisco. And to his right is Eamon Ryan, who is with the Green Party, the leader of the Green Party in the Republic of Ireland, um, raised in Dublin, and uh, happy to be uh, with you today. Thank you for coming all the way out here to join us. Uh, and then to his right is the godfather of clean energy and energy efficiency policy in California, V. John White, who's been uh, running CERT, the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Technology, uh, in Sacramento for many moons. And you know, back in the days when uh, clean energy was, was you could say solar was, was hippie and now it's hip uh, for the folks who were uh, on the front lines uh, you know, decades ago when the costs were, were so much higher, I really want to pay tribute because uh, we wouldn't be where we are today uh, without that early pioneering work. So um, if we could, because we're going to lose Eamon in a few minutes uh, to catch a flight, uh, I'd like to just start with you, if you could share a little bit of your perspective. Um, you know, we're here today to talk about uh, what's happening at the subnational level on climate. And one way to think about California today is that we're essentially a country, the sixth largest economy in the world. And in the absence of um, leadership from the, uh, our leaders in, in Washington, D.C., in fact, more than the absence of leadership, the uh, promotion of some pretty regressive policies pushing us uh, back towards coal, leadership at the subnational level and the international community uh, becomes more important uh, than ever. And California is really excited uh, to partner with all of you uh, in Ireland and Europe on, on uh, climate policies. I wonder if you could share your perspective on uh, the future ahead when you look at um, uh, climate policy and what you see happening uh, from Ireland. Okay, well, first I, I must apologize, as I said, I, I'm just nervous about uh, LA traffic uh, and, and my wife will kill me if I don't get home on this plane. Um, and um, so I, I am going to have to run, which means I can be outrageous. There won't be any callback to me. Um, I fundamentally want to put a position to, I agree with what Marx said. What does he say? I heard the quote, we got to get up off our duff. This was Peter Marx. He was in the session I was just in on, on transit here in, in terms of Los Angeles. I don't know if that's a Californian term or whatever, but I thought it was a good thing because it's true in terms of there's amazing things happening in this city and this state. Um, but we got to do a lot more in terms, particularly in my mind, on the transition to a low carbon uh, future. Um, and in that regard, I, I think it's all, a lot of it, the key action is going to be at a local level. The transition is going to empower our communities because it will build our communities, better transport system, better food systems, better energy systems, community ownership is all part of this transition. So this prospect of the bottom up and the local action and cities doing it is absolutely central and vital. Um, and we'll have different experience. Those of us who live in old cities, uh, and include Los Angeles in that, we'll have a different experience for those who are building new cities. It actually, it's going to be more difficult for us living in old cities where we have to try and retrofit. But I'm a politician, and um, I can't avoid the opportunity by saying, I think one of the key obligations for any city or any state in the US of A is to try and avoid your country being shamed in the world by opting out of the Paris Agreement. 
I think as much as, yes, this is going to be bottom-up, and yes, it's going to be cities, and yes, it's going to be local in every different way, it is also has to be top-down. And the, the crime, if I can call it that, that has been engaged in has to be opposed. Because it is. Peter Maudlin, I was at, a con at the panel we were at the other day, what words did he use? Respectable old man, sort of, sort of voice you'd hear in public radio saying, are we going to allow ourselves into a suicidal pact, was the word he used? So crime is an appropriate level of, and I think it has to be stopped. And it has to be stopped politically. So cities and states, as part of this bottom-up, or coordinate coalition, but in America in particular, it's different to any of the rest of us, your politics is your business. We can't interfere in American politics directly, but you can. And I think you have an obligation to avoid the exit of the US from the Paris Climate Agreement. It's not inevitable. The, the way the timing of, of that provision, which no one expected, is, is organized means that you have time to build that resistance, and I think you do need to. Um, and the second point, just as a caveat, in terms of all about the bottom up, but I actually think as well, my experience is, in, I was former energy minister in the Irish government and looked at this now for good and long and hard on, on the energy piece of it, where, where I particularly work and I'm interested in, and the transport piece. As much as you, you can do a lot in the bottom up, you, you also need a top down approach at the same time. I, I believe Bill McKibben has, has correctly transformed the whole environmental campaign around this by recognizing that if we put all the guilt and shame on the individuals to say it's all about you, it's all about consumer choice, are you driving the right electric vehicle, is that the right autonomous, this, that and the other, whatever, we won't, it won't work. We will not scare and shame and, and put the moral choice down individuals all the time. You need some centralized, coordinated, top-down saying, we're cutting off the coal at source, we're cutting off the oil at source, we're cutting off the gas at source. We, we do need that sort of top-down. And, and it's funny, because it is changing. I mean, we, I mean, five, seven years ago, I, would, I was a peak oiler. I was kind of saying, we're going to defeat oil, which we need to do, because it's going to be too expensive. Here I am seven years later, actually we're going to defeat oil because it's going to be, it's going to be too cheap. It, it won't be able to compete, as we heard at lunchtime today. So things change. But, but I do believe Bill McKibben is right in terms of you cannot just put it all on the end use consumer, you've got to do it from the top down, stop it at source, the start of the pipe rather than the end. And secondly, just from um, experience, we introduced a carbon tax in Ireland, I'm proud of it, we lost a fair bit of political capital in the process, and you need political capital to get this transition through. Uh, we fought tooth and nail and we, and we got it through in government. But I don't think carbon tax is going to work on this kind of carbon tax and bottom up, let the market do. I just don't see. Firstly, carbon tax is marginal change, change at the margin. When we need is massive system change. We need people to make great investment decisions. What we were talking about the other day, California needs to link with Mexico. It links, needs to link with British Columbia. It needs to link with Oregon, uh, Washington State, and all the places in between. That, a carbon tax will not deliver that decision for you. It won't give you the market signal to do it. So again, you need, in that sort of grid decision, you need it top down. And also, I've so many times in the last two days, which have been really rewarding and interesting discussions, we hear the case for people saying you need regulatory standards to control all this. We don't, we don't have a regulatory standard for how you do battery storage, I heard earlier on today. We don't have regulatory standard for water management, non-potable water. I heard a lovely, very interesting guy talking this morning. And again, Regulatory standards, you, you won't come from the bottom up. I mean, states and cities can try and do it, but to be honest, every state doing their own, every city doing their own regulatory standards around that stuff is fooey. Uh, it needs to be international regulatory standards. And the one big regulatory standard of them all in this area where I'm particularly interested is the Paris Agreement. It ain't the best deal. It doesn't tell you, it doesn't mandate everything. But it's a 30, 40 page legal document which sets the regulatory rules. Was it Mickey Cantor the other day speaking about, you know, you need international rules, you need trade, you need globalization going away. Well, I'm sorry. If America is going to um, play any part in this transition and, and to lead, it will, cannot lead it just from some cities on their own. You cannot exit the rules that have been agreed by 197 countries 
30 years it took us diplomacy to get to that point where we got global agreement. You simply cannot pull out of it, and you have an obligation as people who have influence on political. And I don't mean that I wouldn't get caught in a Republican or Democrat round, but there are Republicans. Bob Inglis was a good friend of mine, former Republican congressman of South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, there are good people on the Republican side who will surely understand that message. I think one of the tasks for the cities and the states here and the communities and NGO communities is on that one issue particularly, fight and win. Well, when you're, you're done governing in uh, Ireland, we have a governor's race coming up here if you want to get in that one. Uh, <laughs> We love the passion. Thank you uh, for I'll those comments. Go. No, good, good luck in the LA traffic. You're, you're, you're not wrong to leave early. Um, uh, let's turn next to Jim Wonderman, if we could. Uh, Jim, the business community in California has been uh, pretty remarkable. You look at the suite of California companies just have committed to do 100% renewable energy. Google and Apple and Facebook, um, as well as other national companies, uh, Walmart and, and GM and others. Uh, you have been kind of at the, the eye of the storm on this, uh, really bringing the business community together to work on pushing for a, a climate-friendly future. Uh, one of your initiatives is the California Climate Resilience Challenge. Could you share a little bit about that and your thoughts more broadly about, you know, in a sort of broken uh, federal governance system with respect to this issue of climate, what future you see for the business community uh, and its ability to lead here? Well, th thanks, and thanks for uh, including me on the panel. So, you know, if you go back a little over a decade, uh, we had the legislation that was championed by uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and Speaker Nunes at the time and others, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which was new to us um, and presented, you know, it wasn't new ideas, but the idea of legislating these kinds of controls uh, going forward and having these kinds of redu mandated reductions in greenhouse gas emissions was uh, scary to business as a natural reaction. And so the Bay Area Council is a business association made up of major corporations from every sector in the Bay Area, if you could picture, and the, and the people who sit at the table are mostly CEOs. So we, you know, it, we were working on that law uh, because the Bay Area Council has always been a little bit more progressive than some other groups, and we, we took license to participate as Fran Padley from L.A. and others were working out the language. And we took it to the board uh, you know, for support for a bill that other business groups were opposing. And, you know, one of the members got up in a private meeting, you know, and said we shouldn't support this, it's going to cost money. And then somebody else got up and said, well, no, no, actually we need to be what we've always been. You know, we need to be the, the leaders. We need to be the ones who take risks and can see around the corners. And uh, it's also the right thing to do, given the science, what's happening. So we, we endorsed it uh, unanimously, even the person who raised the issues. And, and so that was a while ago. And since that time, we, you know, it's been a while. Uh, so we've been working on these issues as if they're sort of part of the, the lexicon of how we operate. And it's been good for business, for the state. And uh, Steve, I don't have to take you through what Steve Wesley showed you, but we were also, we had a fund, we also invested in Tesla. And we, all, you know, we also thought, while others thought otherwise, that an electric car company in California was a sensible thing to invest in. People thought that was crazy. That's why you know, they were able to make such a multiple on that investment. So we've been doing that. And you know, I think that there is a large, you know, if you think back on this, we were doing this without the support of the United States. You know, George W. Bush was president at this time. The United States wasn't behind reductions in greenhouse gases or acknowledging the onset of global warming or those kind of things. So we did it anyway. And that's sort of what we've been doing. So I, I certainly agree that it would be better uh, if we were able to stay the course on Paris. It's, it's obviously uh, painful and embarrassing uh, that we didn't. One of the things we did after, you know, you know, with Governor Brown coming aboard, he asked, we had some operations in China 
my friend here, who worked together on a number of things for the years. We, we took Governor Brown on a big trip to China, established a trade office there, and most of his interest has been in the climate change arena. We entered into a large number of MOUs, mostly with provincial governments, but also somewhat with the Chinese national government. And then we went to Beijing for the climate conference, uh, I guess it was now two years ago, and at that, uh, no, I, guess, I think it was last year, when, uh, you know, after the under two M, uh, MOU, MOU was formed. And this, uh, you know, the conference, as you recall, was held two or three days after President Trump pulled out of the Paris Accord. So off we went with a delegation of like 50 people to celebrate what we're doing in California when the, when the President of the United States said we're no longer part of the Paris Accord. We even met with, with uh, Energy Secretary, the new Energy Secretary, Rick Perry. Uh, he wanted to do a photo op with the group, and he assured us, you know, don't worry, we're going to, you know, don't worry about all this kind of stuff. Well, we were, we were, we were worried about it. Uh, <laughs> and we still are, but we think, you know, the bottom line is, uh, you know, in the general terms, we think that uh, there is an economic reality to, uh, to reducing carbon and to deriving energy uh, from other sources than fossil fuels, and that that's going to continue to be the case. This, you know, I think I think my opinion is President Trump and and these folks are too late. Uh, but it doesn't help, uh, as was said. With regard to 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 a really important emerging issue, it's been mentioned a number of times in this conference and down the hall. There's a there's a panel on it. Is is the issue of resilience, and so this is not just a California problem. Uh, this is a global problem. We're, we're dealing with the effects of rising sea levels and, and global warming and the things that it's causing that are, include fire, which both nor northern and southern California experienced in very, very serious ways just recently, and drought, uh, which we went through painfully, and floods, uh, which we had last year, and heat, hottest summer on record in 2017. So, uh, PG&E, our utility uh, in the northern part of the state, just provided the Bay Area Council with a grant uh, to engage in a process that we call a California Resilience uh, Challenge. And this was based on a process used in New York City uh, after, after a Hurricane or Storm Sandy uh, uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation to bring in the best and the brightest design architectural firms uh, in the world to attack the issue of how do we protect the southern area of Manhattan from experiencing another flood like that. And so the result of it was uh, proposals were given and the design teams were awarded some money to be able to develop their ideas and eventually uh, winners were selected who are now doing the work. And we imitated that in the Bay Area uh, with a challenge of our own uh, that was uh, a resiliency challenge, uh, uh, even though we haven't had the floods yet, to make sure that we don't. And so we've just been through that. And so we decided uh, to take it up to the state level and take a look at these issues and bring in teams from around the world to, uh, in, in the 10 hydrological regions of California, as a kind of a nice uh, map. And so for each part, of, each one of the 10 parts of the state, there will be a contest, and firms will come in, uh, and brilliance will, uh, will, will emanate, and a team will be picked, and, and some money will change hands. We're, we're going to try to raise about $8 million uh, to fund this uh, operation, and we're going to release it in San Francisco uh, in, uh, in September when we have the huge uh, uh, summit on climate uh, there, uh, led by Governor Brown. And so this will be a big subject of that, and we'll be working with the state uh, to make this happen. So we're really excited about it. And, th and for those who are interested in it, let us know, because we're not a statewide group, so we're, go we're going to need partners. And we'll be looking for uh, folks who are really into this and see it as an opportunity as well. So exciting, exciting stuff ahead there. And thank you. Great. Uh, and for folks who haven't heard what Jim referred to, the summit in September, we're expecting 3,000 credentialed guests, ministers from around the world coming together, uh, subnationals and others, uh, to push the climate agenda forward. It's a top priority for, for Governor Brown. Jim, you mentioned China, and I wonder, Dr. Chang, if we could turn to you next. Uh, you uh, teach both at Beijing University and Nanjing, and you've been very involved in China policy. 
One thing that struck me as very significant is on the governor's last trip to China, the president of China met with him. My, my wife is Chinese. We're in China every other year to visit family. And you know, for folks who are, who are not familiar with Chinese culture and politics, that never happens. <laughs> I mean, never. <laughs> that a president would meet with a governor, just there's a protocol. And so the significance of that step uh, kind of conferring on, on California almost a nation status and also the elevation of, of California's commitment uh, to, to a clean energy future I thought was very significant. And I'd love to hear your take on what you see happening in, in China and how the roles may be changing um, uh, given the political changes here uh, in the last year in the United States. Uh, thank you, David, for yeah, yeah. organizing this wonderful panel. And I thank all of the audience for taking your time. I know it's a very tiring Tuesday, uh, Tuesday uh, late afternoon yeah. uh, because uh, we have a very intensive panel discussions. Thank you for being here. Uh, you were, I think all of this room will make a great difference because you think climate change is so important, then have a tea outside. Um, Thanks, David, for, for uh, asking me this question. Uh, definitely, the China has very strong protocols. Even you're sitting in, in the dinner table, you need to arrange the seats right. Otherwise, the, the person who arranged the seats might lose the job if they don't do things right. So when the president of, uh, of China meeting, uh, meetings, they, they have to make sure that the rank are uh, very similar. Uh, like uh, you just mentioned that the president should not meet uh, the governors. But the Chinese president also met the mayor of Los Angeles mm -hmm. in Beijing. So uh, that, that shows that how powerful the California is. So uh, California is the leader of the green economy. And at this conference, uh, we regard this as a green Davos uh, for, the, for the world. So I think we have the leader, very for leaders over here. So that's why uh, Chinese presidents will change the rule to meet the California governors. And, uh, and also, I also personally with uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger meet uh, then uh, President Xi in Los Angeles too. So, so I, I think this uh, um, for for the, for the recently administration change, we the the U.S. president suddenly changed it from green to black. So this. I, I, I did not say by, by skin color, by right. the way. <laughs> right, right. Okay, uh, but I think uh, it is it's a very sudden change. I have a lot of friends uh, who used to work at the uh, federal government, and right now, where they are, they are in California. Like, uh, I have a friend who used to work at a at, uh, climate change office in Washington, D.C. Right now, she's working at Energy Foundation in, in, in San Francisco. Yeah, thank you for recruiting him. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I do think that the subnational government uh, will take the greater, greater leader in this one because I work at uh, our 20 regions of climate action. Actually, our organization is exactly set uh, based on this panel um, because uh, the subnational is where the, where the activity happens on the ground. So we needed to make sure that, that not, not only we have the policy, but we also have a project on the ground. Uh, so uh, at R20, we work with the regional governments to understand the demands for the low carbon project and, uh, the, and the policy they need to implement. And then we look for the technology companies. Uh, how can they tackle the problem by putting the project on the ground? We also have the financial partners to give the money to this project to make sure the project will happen uh, rapidly, I, and also we, we also work with a partner who can provide the the platforms. Like so we have the booth over here, the YouTube, uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, the three very good friends uh, sitting on the back back of here. So they're the platform uh, provide the platform for the company can work easier. So so that you can count the energy consumption easier and um, find the products easier and find the, the policy easier because it's very difficult to follow so many things at one time. But if you have the good platform, that will work. So we needed to find the know-how, find the technology, find the finance, and uh, create the real action on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I would just point out, you know, China has played an incredible role the last few years in incubating 
the clean energy industries, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about electric vehicles over the course of the last two days. Mm -hmm. Last year in China, 777,000 EVs um, were sold in the market, a 50% increase from the year before, and that is really helping drive down costs globally. And the same thing, of course, uh, has helped with, uh, with wind and solar. Uh, and one question I have for you to follow up, um, President Trump just uh, last week implemented a 30% tariff on imported uh, solar panels from China, right. uh, which, you know, I've spent my career in the solar industry uh, prior to this job, and I, I have to say I think it's a, um, a self-inflicted wound for us to raise the price on, on uh, clean energy uh, technologies from other countries, and it's not consistent with uh, what we do on all sorts of other industries. Everyone in this room has a cell phone. There's not a single cell phone that's manufactured in the United States. No one's talking about slapping a tariff on cell phones. Um, in fact, most of the jobs, the vast majority uh, in the solar industry in the United States are not in manufacturing, 90%. And it's, we have 260,000 people in the solar industry uh, in the U.S., coal mining is only 51,000, and solar has been growing so fast to, to raise prices, I think, um, is a regressive move, um, which will end up making the technology more expensive, and then that, in turn, reduces the total number of jobs. One question I have for you, do you think there will be any, any countervailing tariffs that China imposes in response to this uh, the solar tariff? Um, that, that is uh, very difficult to say, but I, I, I can guarantee that the clean technology we will not set any barrier for clean technology yeah. from U.S. to China. Maybe might, might be some coal or, or gasoline, or the uh, because I think that if you if you put a wall instead of a bridge, and you have a problem, because uh, you, you know, so President Trump just came back from Davos. He's the one pro proposed to build the walls, and everyone proposed to build the bridges. So he's against the global will. It's not only American wheels. And, and, and also, uh, I'm not sure if everyone knows that he's the only one, only one president in the last 65 years who never visits the great state of California. That means he's not the president of, the, of California. Why need, we need to care about his tech, his policy. So we still need to work as the leader of the green economy in the world and push the green good technology uh, worldwide. When Governor Schwarzenegger stepped up as a governor of California, he established the R20 immediately. He said that if I only work the green policy in California, I probably should not work so hard. It is because I need to use California as a leader, as a flag for the world. That's why he set up R20. So we have to learn a great deal from California in China, like we, we, we learn the carbon market from California. We learn low carbon fuel standard from California. We learn the EV from California. All of the manufacture, car manufacturing in China has to make us EV from now on. Otherwise, you will, you will be shut down. So I think that that is, that is a great example that California set. Yeah, so I, I think uh, this, this policy to set the barrier on the clean products is very, very stupid. I think that especially, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, probably it's not, not, not only these issues, there are a lot of issues because, because Trump that certainly is not uh, the California president because uh, he only gets uh, miserably 30% of the vote from California. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's not to care about him that much because he does not care about California. Right. Yeah. Uh, John White, I wonder if we could turn to you next. Obviously, uh, one of the things that, that um, matters a great deal as we engage as a state with other countries and subnationals around the world is that our success um, continues and that um, this grand experiment uh, continues to prove a success. And there are some threats to um, how we make this, um, this clean energy um, market a success. And I would argue really at the, the core, this kind of poster child for our whole climate policies is what's happening in the electricity sector and the movement away from, from coal and away from gas towards renewables. And for that to succeed, we do need diversity in the energy portfolio. It can't just be uh, wind and solar alone. Um, and it also has to be um, 
easily regulated. And there is, uh, as you've pointed out, a sort of disaggregation happening now among many, many smaller um, community choice aggregators that are getting created, and it becomes a little more of a challenge to, to govern successfully. Could you share your thoughts on these risks and um, how we ought to, to manage those? Thank you, David, and, and thanks to Barrett Exchange for including me on this distinguished panel. Um, uh, first of all, I think the uh, cautions that Eamon uh, expressed earlier are important, that, that we need to have a balance between top-down and bottoms-up. I do think that there is a, a convergence between political activism at the local and the regional level to resist the attack on California, because that's what it is. You know, the, this president has attacked the state of California in terms of his response to the fires, in terms of the tax bill, in terms of the solar tariff. So let's not kid ourselves that this is not a president that dares to show up in California because he's attacked us, okay? So that's the first thing. So we gotta understand what we're dealing with. So secondly, I think we have to recognize that we don't wanna do this alone. If California is isolated, and doing things on our own that no one else is doing um, and spending money that affects the business climate, that that's not gonna be successful either. Uh, our pride and our sense of ourselves needs to be balanced by a sense of what's achievable and what's healthy for us to do. I think, as you mentioned, the, the community choice aggregation um, phenomenon it represents both an opportunity and a threat. The opportunity is that there will be innovation and leadership and new ideas that will come in some of the community choice aggregators. We've seen some really interesting approaches, not just to buying renewables, but to also incenting electric transportation. You know, one of the areas I think we need to do some work on is Uber and Lyft need to start going electric, and they're not going there now and they're threatening transit, they're threatening uh, uh, more increased traffic, and they're not doing their part. So I think we need to think of a way, and I'm not sure if it's incentives or carrots or sticks or whatever, some combination, but everybody's gotta be a good citizen of the, of the economy here. Nobody gets a pass. Um, the other thing, though, about community choice aggregation in, t in, in terms of the threat is that it's going to make planning for the future of the grid to be more difficult because this local control and local option, and we're going to have the cities of Camarillo and Santa Barbara and everybody sitting around a table deciding what the CCA is going to buy. How does that true up with what the grid needs? Because we're past the point where all we need to do is throw kilowatt hours of renewables onto the grid and just magically the greenhouse gas is gonna go down. The fact is, if we don't choose the renewable resources with the work of the grid in mind, we can have 60% renewables and still not make our greenhouse gas target. Okay, so to me, this is one of the risks. The second risk is that we have infrastructure that the grid needs us to buy that we're not gonna buy under the lowest cost of energy, okay? Um, uh, for example, uh, large-scale storage, pumped hydro. I mean, battery storage, I was just on a panel with Ms. Peterman and others, it's great. But it's not the only technology, and in fact, uh, existing hydro, which we've always sort of put off to the side because it's not renewables and we're afraid to compete with solar. Existing hydro from the Northwest and from PG&E and Edison system could be an enormous asset to us reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, but we have to figure out a way to get the market rules right. So to me, we need to figure out, and I don't think the community choice aggregation is getting put back in the box because the politics don't work. Every, you, Sheila Kuehl, everybody out here is for it. Everybody's like, let us go do it. And, and yet the idea that we're gonna be cheaper than the utilities and buy more renewables and not walk away from our obligations is magical thinking, in my opinion. Okay, so somehow we have got to engage our friends in community choice world, and they're hiring people, they got lawyers, they got lobbyists, they got new people getting hired. Those people are gonna have to step up and learn this business and learn how they can make a contribution, not just based on their local preferences, but based on what the system as a whole needs. And I think we would be 
we would be premature as we were some years ago in imagining that the utilities are obsolete and are going to go the way of, uh, of, of AT&T before the break, that, that we're gonna not be able to do everything that we need simply with third party distribution uh, energy resources and community choice aggregation. We're gonna need the utilities, we're gonna need them to buy things that the grid needs that we all need to pay for. So that's the other thing is that as we go forward, I, I think the other opportunity I want to mention though that I hope we can highlight in the, in the summit in September is I think the West Coast plus Nevada has the opportunity to work more closely together in operating our grid. I, I think we'll eventually get British Columbia and, and Baja. We have got a good start with the energy imbalance market which allows trading across uh, the, 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 the Western interconnection and includes, is going to include important constituencies like LA Department of Water and Power because the energy imbalance market is voluntary, okay? So it doesn't raise all the questions of a mandatory grid that everybody's in, but it's the direction we need to go and I think, I believe that the Western part of the United States has the best chance of achieving the 2050, 80 percent reduction of any other part of North America, but we cannot do it acting unilaterally. We cannot do it acting with total local input. We're gonna to have to work regionally. And eventually, if we can show this is successful, we have a template and a path forward that we can show other parts of the world and, and other parts of the United States. Great, thank you, John. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question of the, of the panel, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience and discussion. But before I do, just one thunderous point of agreement. You mentioned the need to get Uber and Lyft uh, to adopt electric vehicles. I'm in thunderous agreement with that. I bought the Chevy Bolt EV uh, exactly a year ago. Yesterday was the one-year anniversary. I'd driven it 10,000 miles. An Uber driver um, actually typically drives about 50,000 miles a year. And actually, at the end of the day, what matters is not electric vehicles sold in the market, but gas miles avoided. And so actually, it's a much higher leverage play to get EVs in the hands of Uber and Lyft drivers. Also, by the way, a great way to introduce their passengers to uh, EV technology. And it is time for California to start having this conversation, whether you make, uh, for example, their permit to operate in a community contingent on some penetration level, of EVs, whether you find a way to offer higher compensation to Uber and Lyft drivers who are driving EVs, or other levers we can use to focus on that. It's important not just for the pollution and we're seeing in the transportation sector, but also ultimately for renewables integration. EVs really play an important uh, part of that. It's a great, great um, point you make, John. Um, so my last question, just to, for anyone on the panel, I mean, stepping back, if you look at the situation that we're in, it's quite unique. The Congress of the United States is the only governing body in the world where uh, climate change does not seem to be a real, a real threat. I mean, it really is, is unique in the globe today. Every single other nation uh, is a party to the Paris Agreement. Um, and I wanna ask what it will really take for that to change. If you look, I think one analogy uh, might be marriage equality. If you go back in the United States 15 years ago, marriage equality was legal nowhere, right? And then state by state by state by state, uh, they got the policies passed, but more importantly, they also changed public opinion. And so you went from 35% of the public supporting marriage equality 10, 15 years ago to today it's 65, 70% in support. How do they do that? Part of it was a messaging campaign. They really made it about love and government has no right to get between two people who love each other. I think actually the same message should apply to climate. This is really also about love, but love of the next generation. Um, and I just wanna ask uh, anyone who'd like to respond, what do you think it will really take to see a similar evolution um, with Congress on the issue of climate? I think if the Republicans lose 30 seats in 2018, that'll be that'll a start. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I think, is this on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, 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 I learned this, uh, I think that to pass the, the message to people's heart is very difficult. I think you, you really need to, work, to, to think of what the general public are thinking. 
So Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger always said, when we communicate climate change to the general public, we have to use the four leg stools. So climate change science is one, but not, not so many people care about the climate science itself. Like the, the people in uh, Colorado, they probably don't care about the sea level rise, right? So it does not affect them. So if anything does not have anything to do with a person's life, they probably will just uh, use that as noise. But he also said that so if, if we use connect with the public health, so climate change is affecting your health, climate change is affecting national security, climate change is affecting the job opportunities. If you use all of the four leg stools, and uh, maybe one of the leg stools will touch one person's heart, you have to use very convincing words to, to let people know and change them, and let them know what they should do. Right, yeah. right. Oh, great point. Um, yeah. Let's open it up for the audience. Any, um, any questions uh, anyone would, would like to ask to, uh, to members of the panel? And while we're waiting, I'll just share, you know, I think one reason why there's not a real debate about climate in California is because we are living it. We just went through five years of the most severe right. drought we've had in decades in the state, followed by 200% of annual rainfall in six months in the first part of last year, followed by another dry period which led to the worst forest fires in the history of the state in Northern California, a record that was broken two months later by even bigger forest fires in the southern part of the state which led later to mudslides. I mean, this is uh, our reality now and, and this is climate change and that's why I just don't think that debate is ever gonna happen in California. We already know we're, we're living it. Uh, was that a question in the back? Yeah, go ahead. Let me, let me take this question, it's a great question. Uh, actually, I just visited uh, BYD um, uh, manufacturing in Lancaster uh, two weeks ago. So actually, we're, we understand that this is a great challenge. So uh, the, the, especially the, the, in the port, there's a lot of truck going uh, pass through there. So there, there, are a lot of, uh, op, uh, there are a lot of solutions for the truck already. So I think uh, definitely we need, a, we need a time to reach the level that uh, uh, that clean truck uh, is uh, feasibly available. Uh, I do uh, know that uh, there are a lot of orders for the truck uh, and, and also buses uh, from the BYD. And I think that more and more people will get in, involved to this business. And uh, the, definitely the, the, the diesel truck is, uh, is uh, the dirtiest vehicle on the road. So we need to take that into account. Yeah, if I can add, uh, I, I've worked on diesel emissions issues for 25 years, and, and the, the biggest problem that we face is how long the diesel engines, and they last. They get rebuilt two or three times, and, and so it's not really a matter of finding the new technologies that can get to clean air. I mean, people are arguing about electric versus natural gas, but as you pointed out, the problem is the volume of pollution is coming from the existing fleet, and turning that fleet over is gonna take money right. that 
can only be <clears throat> spent in a way that basically is like a scrappage program where you're, you may think your truck is, is still got some miles, but we're gonna incent you to trade it in and get a new truck. And, and the problem we have in the ports, as you know, is that the drivers <clears throat> are contract employees and basically not in a position to buy the new truck, and yet the companies disclaim responsibility. So, so there's structural problems in that industry, but I do think that as part of our greenhouse gas reduction funding programs, we are targeting goods movement and replacement of, of trucks. I also think that um, simply we have to think in terms of scrappage, uh, and, and paying people to turn them in, sort of like guns or something, and, you know, we just, you, this is a weapon that needs to be disposed of. On the other hand, the importance of the ports and the goods movement to the economy is strategically important, so you can't just ignore the, the who pays question. So I think we're gonna probably need more revenues. I talked to my friend Denny Zane uh, about the possibility of a ballot measure to try to provide more money because we, we have these plans for cleaning up the ports and doing all this stuff, but the money that it's gonna take is beyond our current means. So we have to think of how we're gonna pay for it and recognize that that's a part of what we need to do and it will have, as you said, benefits for public health for community well-being as well as for climate change. So I think it's a valuable thing to focus on and I thank you for your question. Great, with that we have to wrap up. Let's please give our thanks to the panel. Thank you.